days as a change in view. An anticyclone over western France has brought clear skies to southern Britain and we can look forward to a fine, clear night with a good deal of sunshine tomorrow. For all the meteorologists can do, the weather in these islands remains unpredictable. If we turn to natural phenomena, will we get better results? Well, they could hardly be worse, so let's try. Red sky at night, shepherd's delight. Red sky in the morning, shepherd's warning. Probably the best known weather saying, and it works. A glorious red sunset is caused by dust in a dry atmosphere, diffusing the sun's rays. Damp, clear air would produce a watery yellow sunset. In summer, which is when most people are looking anxiously for fine days, the weather in Europe is dominated by a stream of cold fronts, bands of clouds sweeping in from the Atlantic. When we look westwards into the sunset, we're looking through the approaching air mass. If the sunset is red, tomorrow's air is dry. If the sun rises red, the dry air is going away, probably to be followed by a band of damp air, shepherd's warning. When the dry air arrives, it brings us a lovely morning like this. The cows are standing up, but that's not necessarily a good weather sign. It means the grass is still wet with dew. Here's the sign that it's going to be a fine day. The scarlet pimpernel flowers are open. They call it shepherd's sundial, or plowman's weather glass. And if it's fully open first thing, it won't rain on the same day. That's because the same dry air that causes the dew to evaporate so quickly also opens the flowers after their night's sleep. From May to September, while the pimpernel is in flower, it's better than a barometer. Next to the barometer, the clock, the dandelion clock. It's not much good at telling the time unless it's a nice dry afternoon. If the dandelion clock gets the time right in the afternoon, then you know it's going to stay fine for at least a few hours. Like the scarlet pimpernel, the dandelion reacts to the dryness of the air. It only releases its seeds when they're fully airworthy, in other words, when they're dry. In damp weather, they won't fly anywhere. In weather like this, the dandelion only works as a digital clock. In damp weather, the scarlet pimpernel stays shut. But oddly enough, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to rain. On four days out of five, when the pimpernels are closed, it doesn't rain. And the fifth is probably the one for which you've packed the picnic basket. Rain does more than spoil picnics. For some animals, rabbits for example, rainy weather can be dangerous. In spite of their big eyes and effective all-round vision, Rabbits live as much by sound as by sight. Scent is important to them too. They normally feed at night, listening intently and sniffing the air as they eat for any sign of an approaching predator. Rain drowns out the sound and damps down the scent. So in wet weather, rabbits feed by day, relying on their eyes to give them warning. That's why people say that rabbits feeding by day is a sign of rain. It's most probably a sign that it's raining already. For longer term forecasts, country people turn to other animals. Moles are closely observed for clues to the coming season. If their hills are large and numerous, people say it's a sign of warm or mild weather to come. Others say it's a sign of rain. Opinions will always differ, and for a very good reason. As far as anyone can tell, the number and size of molehills has nothing to do with the weather, but everything to do with the supply of earthworms, the mole's favourite food. New molehills appearing in late autumn have a little more significance. They're a sign that the mole is preparing for winter by opening up its deep burrow system, which it doesn't use so much in the summer. Why does it do it? Because the earthworms go down deeper in winter. Since watching moles and mole hills is somewhat more attractive and certainly easier than watching earthworms, people give the mole credit for being able to predict what's to come in the way of weather.
That leads us into the lovely chain of events which foretells the coming of spring and the arrival of spring and summer showers. The greater celandine is known as the swallow flower. It comes from the Greek word kilidon, which means a swallow. Traditionally, the celandines come into flower just as the swallows return to us from Africa. And so they should. Plants produce flowers in response to the length of the day and the temperature. Swallows migrate northwards in response to the length of the day and the changing weather patterns over North Africa and Europe. It makes sense that celandine flowers and swallows should appear at about the same time each year. Anyway, that's how the flower got its name. The swallows arrive when they do because the insect population is building up as the increasing air temperature arouses them from hibernation or causes their eggs to hatch. The swallow didn't get its name from the fact that it swallows huge quantities of insects, though it does, especially when it has chicks to feed. It's more likely that its name comes from the way it flies, swirling about in the sky, swirlo, and that's where it comes into our weather story. All over the country, people say that swallows flying low foretell rain. And it's a pretty good prediction. Here's how it might work. Imagine there's a cold front coming across these fields. As the cold air pushes forward, clouds form where it meets warmer air. The leading edge of the cold air wedges under the warm air, lifting it and causing turbulence. Some of the insects in the air column are lifted by this disturbed air, they're followed by hungry swifts, strong and agile flyers. The swirling cold air forces other insects lower so that they fly only a little way above the ground. Swallows, lighter and more delicate than swifts, follow them down to feed on them. Rather like the mole showing us what the earthworms are doing, the swallows and swifts show us what the insects are doing. And the insects tell us something about the air movements. And sure enough, the air movements which make swallows fly low often lead to a shower. To get back to the seasons, autumn arrives with plenty of warning in the form of colour changes in the trees, fruit ripening, a certain crispness in the air and the nights drawing in. It's this last clue, the days getting shorter, which starts most plants and animals preparing for winter. The temperature has something to do with it, but the shortening days set up the trigger mechanism. Rather like cricketers, many plants and animals will remain active, whatever the weather, until darkness starts to come too soon. As the leaves fall, no matter how mild the autumn, queen bumblebees go into hibernation, because the flowers they feed on have stopped producing nectar. They're producing fruit instead. Luscious elderberries blacken in the thin autumn sunshine to tempt birds to spread their seeds. Seeds are everywhere, all of them potential food for birds and other small animals. On blackberry brambles, the last of the fruit is scorned by humans but snapped up by birds. The blackberries have lost their sweet taste, but they still contain enough food value to make them worth gathering. It's not just birds either. Field mice, voles and harvest mice climb autumn hedges for the last of the blackberries. Probably the best known saying after red sky at night has to do with berries. Hips and haws and holly berries are supposed to provide a wealth of food for the birds as a sign of a hard winter to come. Nature looks after her own and all that. One hates to throw cold water on the idea, especially at this time of year, but it's just not true. The number of berries on the bushes is simply a sign that it's been a good productive summer. A hard winter sometimes follows a good summer, but there's no guarantee of it. After a poor fruiting season, a severe winter will kill half the small bird population, maybe more. Large birds, stronger on the wing, can move to escape the worst of the weather. In Spain, they call the lapwing ave fria, the cold bird, because it appears only when the severest weather has driven it out of more northerly countries, such as Britain. For the smaller fry, which can't keep out of the dangers of winter, 
human activities provide a lifeline. Fortunately for sparrows and finches, sheep are not very possessive about their winter rations. There's no cheese here, whether the yellow hammer wants it or not. No little bit of bread either. If nature does look after her own, it's by pitilessly thinning out the population until only the toughest can survive. The birds call a truce in winter, forgetting the territorial disputes of spring and summer in a joint search for whatever might keep them going. Their diets converge as well. Larks normally eat insects, but in the snow, they have to be prepared to share seeds with the chaffinches. At this time of year, the birds aren't predicting anything they're reacting to the conditions. It's not much help to know that small birds gather to feed in mixed flocks during hard winter weather. Shivering humanity can judge the weather for itself without consulting the birds. Incidentally, birds look tubby in winter because they've got all their body feathers fluffed out to keep warm, not because they're well fed. Most of the time they're permanently hungry. They can't forecast their next bite of food, never mind the weather. The blue tit is a special case, not because people predict the weather from its activities, but because it has to predict the weather for itself if its daring breeding strategy is to succeed. Of all our well-loved garden birds, the blue tit has the biggest stake in guessing accurately when spring will arrive. Blue tits begin nesting before the appearance of the main food supply for their chicks. For them, it's crucial to predict the hatching time of the caterpillars of the winter moth and the feathered thorn moth, among others. Furthermore, they must make their guess a month in advance. The investment is enormous. Gathering nesting material, in this case the fur from a dead rabbit, takes time and energy at a season when food isn't readily available. Yet by the time the chicks have hatched, a month later, there are caterpillars everywhere. How do the tits get it right year after year? Could we predict the arrival of spring more accurately if we understood? The answer is yes, we could, but only if we could search the trees and bushes as closely as blue tits do. The evidence now suggests that the secret lies in the bird's courtship behaviour, in which the male finds what early insects he can to give to the female. She digests his offerings until she's well fed enough to start producing eggs. By then, the whole insect population is recovering from winter. The moths have laid their eggs, and the caterpillars appear on cue, in time for the chicks to eat them. Sometimes, it seems, even the voracious chicks have had enough caterpillars. Blue tits aren't the only animals which seem to have an uncanny knack of predicting the change of the seasons. In their case, if scientists are right, it's not a magical sixth sense, but a matter of being able to gear themselves into the natural cycle by responding to cues such as the emergence of the earliest insects. A particularly damp spring or a succession of cold days can make food too hard to find and cause the first brood of chicks to starve. The tits don't always get it right. If the first attempt fails, they'll try again when the season is properly established.
In Africa, where the long-awaited season is not the warm weather but the coming of the rains, the best weather forecaster is the boo-boo shrike. Just before the rains appear, the dusty bush begins to ring with its call. Sure enough, the rains follow, or so a lot of people say. Others watch the behaviour of safari ants or listen for the call of the kukul. Everyone in Africa longs for rain. An optimist will snatch at almost anything as the first sign of relief from drought. Among animals which must have water to survive, waiting for the rains is not enough. Wildebeest follow the path of the rain clouds, not for the water itself, though that's vital in its own way, but for the fresh grass which springs up after the first rain has fallen. In their migrations, they're not predicting the weather, but following it, literally chasing the thunderclouds on the horizon. It's not clear whether they smell the rain from far away, or hear the thunder, or simply see the clouds in the distance. But what is immediately apparent is the urgency of their need to be where rain is falling. Hundreds of thousands of wildebeest move off the Serengeti plains and back again every year, a living weather map, charting the rainfall with their hooves. Further north, white-eared cob in the Sudan migrate over a route which carries them a thousand miles every year. First, they move north to eat the grass exposed by the receding waters of the Nile floodplain. There's nothing meteorological in that. But afterwards, they have to move south again, across the now dry and inhospitable plain, in search of fresh grass. Presumably, the instinct to move to the south is bred into the herd, but the location of individual rainstorms is impossible to predict. Whether they find them by sound or sight or scent, the herd moves as one towards the rain. Many of them die during this parched progress. To a cob, the observation of weather is a matter of life and death. They've been known to make fruitless round trips of 200 miles, following a cloud which failed to disgorge its promised rainfall. When they finally meet the advancing rains, they're a weary and undernourished group indeed. If the rains fail or come later, and they're sometimes very late, cob will die by the thousand. Later, in the far south, their problem will be too much water, not too little. But that's another story. Other migrants follow climatic changes. Some, like barnacle geese, move north to take advantage of the very short but abundant Arctic summer. Their movement has to be precisely timed. To human observers, it means that spring is at last arriving. The way in which the geese time their departure is still not clear. But there's a pronounced shift in the pattern of high and low pressure over Europe from winter to spring. And it's just possible the birds can detect its effects, sensitised as they are by the increasing length of daylight.
the geese leave our shores in early April, at about the same time as storks are returning to Europe from their winter quarters in South Africa. At this time of year, millions of birds, of all sorts, shapes and sizes, are moving up and down the globe. And in each country in the Northern Hemisphere, one species or another is being welcomed as the herald of spring. In Germany, the return of the storks is an occasion for celebration, not least because they're survivors of a dwindling band. As weather prophets, the storks are very accurate. They move north with the European anticyclone, soaring around the eastern shore of the Mediterranean, propelled by the huge flow of warm air from the south. This air mass is, in a very real sense, the summer itself, and the storks come in on its leading edge. There may well be showers or patches of cool air within the summer airflow, but once the weather pattern has started to change from winter to summer, it will keep on. One swallow, or two stalks for that matter, might not make a summer, but it's a sign that summer's not far away. Many people say that the best weather forecaster is the calendar. In terms of the average air temperature from season to season, that's true. From day to day in this country, it's a nonsense. Crocuses flower on about the same date every year, come snow or shine. They survive because at or around that date, the air temperature will almost certainly be suitable, even if on the day they first open it's a little chilly. Whether we recognize it or not, spring arrives more or less on cue every year. What we in Britain have to accept is that our little offshore islands have a climate which can be relied on, but weather which can't. That's probably why we have a worldwide reputation for talking about the weather. And furthermore, why we cast about desperately looking for clues, guessing the chances for tomorrow. We even listen to television weather forecasts. That's all from me, Chris Kelly. Now here's the weather forecast. Leading by day all over the West Country and the dandelion clock's three hours slow, we shan't be looking for open scarlet pimpernels tomorrow. On the other hand, there was a lovely red sky tonight. My advice is to have a look at the sky in the morning before you set out. If you get water in your eye, it's raining.